need God with us. I don't think there's any better word, one single word that can sum up the entire Christmas story. In one word, that is the most biblical word that could be used to describe why we are here tonight, why you will gather with your family and friends tomorrow, why there are trees and lights and you name it and Christmas has it. The truth that God closed himself in flesh and came to dwell among us, to be in our presence. Now, there's a very real sense that God is everywhere, that we can never get outside of God's presence. Psalm 139 is a tremendous passage that teaches us this great truth that the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, transcends space and time, and He knows us and all of our days intimately and perfectly. Psalm 139, O oh Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar, you search out my path and my lying down, you and are acquainted with all of my ways. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So God is everywhere. However, there have been specific times throughout biblical history where God has condescended to earth in a real, physical manifestation of himself to be amongst his people in a unique way that is unlike his presence with the rest of the creation. And his birth in Bethlehem was not the first time. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In six days, God created all things. Day one, he created the light and separated the light from the darkness. And the light he called day and the darkness he called night. Day two, he separated, or he made the sky by separating the waters that were above from the waters that were below. Day three, God created the dry land and the seas and all vegetation, plants and trees with their seeds in them so that they might be able to reproduce themselves. Day four, sun, moon, and stars, and placed them in the heavens to be signs for days and seasons and months and years. Day five, all water creatures and all birds. Day six, land animals and most important, man. In Genesis 1 verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. However, there was something different about the way that he made man. All other created things, when the text it describes how God created them, God simply said, let there be, and there was. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be an expanse, and it was so. God said, let there be lights in the expanse, and it was so. But when God made man, when he came to the creation of man, it says that God said, let us make. For the creation of man, there was something a little bit more personal, a little bit more intimate in his involvement in the creation of man. This is pinnacle of creation. Later in Genesis 2, it the text tells us that God formed man from the dust of the earth, almost like a, a master potter takes clay and forms his piece of art. And God breathed into man, giving him life. All other things were simply spoken into existence. I say simply as if that's an easy thing. <laughs> but all other things were spoken into existence, but man was intricately crafted by the Creator. But not only was there intimacy in how God created, but there was also intimacy in what God created, because it says in Genesis 1.26 that God said, let us make man in our image. Man was made in the image of God. And this really isn't about what man looks like as much as it is about the characteristics of man. For centuries, theologians have gone back and forth debating 
this situation exists exactly what it means for man to be created in the image of God. But basically what it means is that man was created to be like God and to represent God. Man was to be made in the image of God. And for man, for man to be like God is meant that man is a moral, spiritual, intelligent, rational, and personal being. The only aspect of God's creation who is capable of having a personal relationship with the Creator. Because everything that God created has a relationship with God. In that everything that God made is created and He is the Creator. Fish and birds have a Creator-creature relationship with God. Donkeys and cows have a Creator-creature relationship with God. The sun, moon, and stars have a Creator-created relationship with God. And to a certain extent, man, we have that same relationship with God. And that God is the Creator and we are what He created. But there's something more deeper and greater in that man is set apart from all the rest of creation in that man was made to be similar to God and to represent Him. And because man has been given this capability of having interpersonal relationships, that means that one of the purposes for the creation of man was so that we could have a personal relationship with God. God made us to have a relationship with Him, not because He was lonely and needed friends, but ultimately so that we can have a personal relationship with Him so that we might reflect His glory as the greatest aspect of His creation. No doubt this relationship started with the first man, Adam, as God formed him from the dust and gave him life. And not only did he give him life, but he gave him instructions on what he was supposed to do. God placed Adam in the garden of Eden and said that he was to work it and to keep it. Then God brought all the animals to Adam to name all of the animals. So Adam was a busy guy. And not only that, but God also made a helper that was suitable for him, a wife that was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So you see in these first two chapters of the Bible, God communicating with man, God giving gifts to man, giving responsibilities and providing for man. All of these are elements of a personal relationship that God had with man. If you want a little, a little explanation about how this kind of works. It's kind of like the relationship that you might have with your children versus the relationship that you have with your dog. You love both and you provide for both, but the relationship beyond that is pretty different. Um, to a certain degree, your children are made in your image. They are like you for the obvious reason that they stand upright, have multiple thumbs, and are rational sometimes. <laughs> But far beyond the physical attributes are the personal character traits, that they act like you, which is both awesome and scary at the same time. It's not that way with your dog. Your dog is not from you. Your dog is not made in your image. Your dog has four legs and slobbers and does all the other sort of gross things the dogs do. And you had to go to the pound or to the pet store or to somebody's house to go get your dog and bring him to your house. And yes, you love this animal, but it is not part of it. It is different. The relationship is different that you have with your dog than you have with your children because your relationship with your child is so much deeper and greater than it is with your dog. The same thing is with the relationship that God has with man versus God and the rest of creation. God made man to have this personal relationship that started with Adam in his place in paradise. We don't know how long that paradise lasted. It had to last long enough for Adam to name the animals, for God to create Eve, and for him to instruct them, and for God to give them the, the, the guidelines of what they were supposed to do in terms of having babies and keeping the garden and doing what they were supposed to do. Yet all this time, God and man had this incredible personal relationship. Even in the events of chapter 3, when it talks of God walking with his walking with Adam, or walking in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day, indicates that this was a common occurrence. Almost as if God had an appointment with Adam every afternoon, where they would spend wonderful times unhindered in personal relationship. 
the creator with the one who was made for his image. However, it is in chapter 3 when we read that the servant comes to Eve and says, God actually say. And that question ultimately led Eve to doubt God's provision, to doubt God's word, which led to her eating the forbidden fruit, and she gave it to Adam, who also ate and utter and blatant defiance of the command of God, and all of a sudden, that perfect, intimate, personal relationship with God is broken. Man is now marred by sin, eternally separated from a perfectly holy God. Before there was joy and peace and life, and now there is nothing but sin, rebellion, and death. God's original intention for a perfect, intimate, interpersonal relationship with man was ruined because of sin. God made them without sin. Put them in a perfect place of paradise. And still, man rebelled against God. Fast forward a few thousand years to the next time God comes to be among his people. It's Exodus 19, and the children of Israel had left Egypt, being free from slavery by God, and they have come to Mount Sinai there. When they are at the base of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up to the mountain to talk with God, and God says this to Moses, you yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom. God rescued Israel out of slavery because Israel is his treasured possession. Israel is God's chosen people throughout the whole world. And God had a special task for them. God wanted them to be a holy nation and to be a nation and a kingdom of priests. Which means that they were to be the mediators between God and man. They were to represent man to God and they were to represent God to man. It was Israel's job to let the world know about God, which is why God said, I want you to be a holy nation, because God is holy. And in order for the world to know that God is holy, God wants his people to be holy as well. And again, a part of this relationship between Israel and God, this personal relationship with Israel and God, was for him to dwell within their midst. And the way that this was to be accomplished was construction of the tabernacle, that tent-like structure that traveled with the Israelites as they wandered the desert and into the promised land that would, soon, that would soon be replaced by the temple that Solomon constructed. And this place would be the location of the physical representation of the presence of God with his people. And God gives us the reason. In Exodus 25 verse 8 he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell God's desire for the construction of the tabernacle was to dwell with his people. God's desire for the construction of later of the temple was for him to dwell with his people. And then at the end of the book of Exodus, when the tabernacle is constructed, that's exactly what happens. The glory of God comes to fill the tabernacle. In 1 Kings chapter 8, the same thing happens when the, when, the, when the temple is constructed and the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the Holy of Holies. The glory of God fills the temple. But unfortunately, as you read on in the Old Testament, you find that just as sin ruined the initial relationship with man, sin ruined the relationship with Israel as well. See, in the garden, it was one sin, it was one act of defiance that severed the relationship. Whereas with the nation of Israel, it was centuries of idolatry and spiritual adultery and just straight rejected, rejection of God. As you read, king after king who did evil in the sight of the Lord, plunging the people of Israel deeper and deeper into sin. King after king set up idols and pagan places for worship. Kings who should have been representing God, leading the people in the worship of the true God of heaven. Instead, they went the completely opposite direction and led the people to worship pagan gods. To worship false gods who demanded the sacrificing of their children and worth. 
And all of this rebellion climaxed in Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11, where the prophet tells us that the, that the presence of God departs from the temple and returns to heaven. So once again, sin severed God's relationship with man. Sin ruined God's desire to dwell in his people. But fast forward a few hundred years more. And once again, you see God condescending from heaven to be among his people. To be among his people in a real, physical, tangible manifestation of himself. We read together, John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the great truth that we celebrate tonight. This is the truth the birth of Christ, the coming of Emmanuel. This is what we celebrate. This is who we celebrate, that the eternal God came to dwell with us. And John is being very specific with the word choice that he uses here. When it says that the word came to dwell among us, that word could also be translated, lived in his tent, or pitched his tabernacle. So John is being very specific to show us that Christ coming to dwell with his people is connected with God's desire for the tabernacle in the Old Testament for him to dwell with his people, which is ultimately connected to God's creation for man, for him to have a personal relationship with us, his highest aspect of his creation, so that we might bring him the most glory as the almighty creator of all things and the sustainer of all things. But there's something different about this time. Something different about God condescending and coming, which is completely different and unlike anything that he had done before. Because this time God did not come in the form of a heavenly being like he did in the garden. God did not come in the form of a pillar of cloud and fire like he did in the tabernacle. No, this time God came to earth to be among his people by being like his people. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is both fully God and fully man at the same time. He is the image, Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. But at the same time, Hebrews 2 tells us that he was made a little lower like the angels. He partook of flesh and blood, and he was made like us in every respect. So Jesus came to be the God of man. But there's also something different in the result of his coming this time. In the garden, God came to be with man and enjoy a personal relationship with his greatest creation. Man was intricately created by his creator, made without sin, placed in perfect paradise. Placed in a location where this personal relationship with God had every reason to thrive. Yet sin ruined that relationship. In the tabernacle, God was very clear with his people for the purpose of the tabernacle. He wanted to be with his people. He gave them a specific blueprint for the building, a place of worship. He provided a physical manifestation of his presence in the cloud and fire, in the pillar of cloud and fire. If, in that, if the people ever doubted God's presence with them, all they had to do was look out of their tent and say, yep, there's the cloud, God is still with us. But sin ruined that relationship. And sin continues to destroy man's relationship with God. All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All men have broken God's law and have offended His eternal holiness. And as a result, all men deserve to be eternally separated from God in hell. But the Word became flesh. And an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for what? For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this is the reason why we celebrate. 
that God came to earth. God became a man in order to save man. The baby that was born in Bethlehem grew up to die on a cross. The one who was wrapped in swaddling clothes and blood and laid in a manger was killed and put in a tomb. The one for whom the angels sang received the eternal wrath of God, all for the purpose so that you might be saved from your sin if you would but put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, repenting of your sin and turning to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God punished Christ for the sins of those who would believe in him. God sent Christ to be the one who would take our punishment, the punishment, the eternal punishment, the wrath of God that we deserve, and placed it upon Christ so that he could take Christ's righteousness and place it on him. Christ was punished as if he had committed our sins so that we could be treated as if we had lived Christ's life. That is truly good news. But good news doesn't stop there. There will be another time when God will be with His people. But the next time has yet to take place. The next time waits for fulfillment in the future. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Revelation chapter 21 is at the end of the Bible, and the Apostle John is describing the scene in heaven. In the new heavens and the new earth, when God is done with this world, and this world has run its course, and the end of time has come. And you probably picked it up by me simply reading it. But the next time that God will be with his people, it won't be God coming to be with us. It will be God gathering his people to take them to be with him forever. In heaven. In a place where there is no sin. And where this personal relationship between God and man can never be. You can be a part of it. See, Christmas is about a man. God coming to be with his people. But don't miss the fact that God came to be with his people so that he might save his people. And God saves his people by his people having faith in God. God became man, <clears throat> Excuse me. died on the cross, was buried, rose again, ascended back to heaven, <clears throat> all to provide eternal salvation and eternal life for those who have repented their sins, turn to Christ, and seek Him for the forgiveness that only He Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus simply a baby in a manger? Or is he your Savior, your Lord, your King? I pray that this Christmas season
thank you for this time here that we can gather around, gather together and sing songs of praise to you. Sing songs that remind us of the glory of Christ, the, the reason why he came, the salvation that he brings. And I pray that if there are those here tonight who don't know you as Lord and Savior, that tonight will be the night that you have convicted their hearts and helped them to see their need for Savior, that, that Christmas is not about presents and lights and trees. It is about Christ and the salvation that is available only for you. We thank you and praise you for your goodness and your grace. In your name, let me pray. Amen. Will you please stand with me as we sing some final songs? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs>